Every day at MIT, America's performance as a world leader is in rehearsal. When I was in elementary school, I had heard about MIT, and it seemed to be a, a great wizard's castle, a place where the finest students go to learn all there is to know about science. I first became interested in MIT and science at the same time when the Russians put up Sputnik and the whole nation was concerned about science, and MIT was playing a large role in our rocket program, and uh, I saw it as the sort of the capital of science in the United States, perhaps the whole world. MIT started life just over a century ago as an engineering school. From the beginning, it believed that a top-level education could be founded on science and engineering. Today, MIT is unique in the world, a university that lives and breathes science. Well, this gave rise then to, uh, it can in fact, in, in the, the analytical treatment, give rise to very complicated integrals that we found we could we could work them out most simply by use of the vibration curve technique and quite specifically uh, our problem boils down to integrating uh, the a complex function which is uh, at least it's most easily done in complex notation so that we have a e to the omega t minus uh, r MIT engineering made possible Polaris missiles and the Polaris submarines and MIT know-how will guide the first Americans to the moon and back. For anyone who wants to get into science and technology in America, MIT is the number one school. The really outstanding thing about MIT is its lack of complacency. It seems to me that it's an outstanding example of the involvement of the academic community in today's technical society. For many students, going to school at MIT is a fierce intellectual battle. As they fight their way from one crisis to another, overwork becomes a normal condition. There are 3,500 undergraduates at MIT. Most of them like it. Even if they don't like the tension, they like the results it produces. The small handful of students who hate the place will admit that it's got something, something unique. Give them, uh, he'll give you the first three beats, you come in the fourth beat. Okay? One, two, three. At MIT, a student's itch to know gets pushed into areas that normally don't exist in schools of engineering and science. Philosophy, literature, and other humanities courses occupy a fifth of every student's time. Each week, these students write original music for performance by the rest of the class. 
of what you say, you see. Well, that's what he did there. Any other opinions around here? That it was balanced much more toward the analysis than toward the criticism. <coughs> and maybe this is what criticism is, but... Uh, you see, there is a borderline here, Mr. Goldsmith. There undoubtedly is. Well, where do you want to sit here? Are uh, you written the final criticism, Mr. Not yet. That's why I'm waiting. I'm okay, waiting. Mr. Goldsmith. <laughs> We're going to light on you. How analytic are you going to be, boy? How do you know that probability will hold now? That uh, the probability is supposedly is, uh, what you're suggesting is the probability is one of the is the, one of the laws of nature, let's say, or the laws which is inherent which are inherent in the nature of things so that it, too, may be suspended at any moment and requires an act of faith. MIT is one of the few places in the world where art and science have really come to terms with each other. As they are forced to examine their own and other people's prejudices, engineers who think they know all the answers learn to tolerate doubt and complexity. And would-be philosophers find something to get their teeth into. I think there's a very, a very important thing about being a humanities major, particularly at MIT, because MIT typifies science in America, in a sense. And I think that the major problem today is to make sense of, of what science is doing to society as a whole. And the scientist isn't taking time to make sense of this. He's too busy being a scientist, and it's for the humanitarian to make sense of the scientific endeavor. The urge to stand back and take a look at what science means is probably stronger at MIT than other places because MIT itself is a kind of machine. An education from MIT can be very factory-like, very stilted, if the student allows it. And it, it is probably more easy here to let that happen than at, at most other schools. Uh, the academic pressure is so hard, it's, it's fairly easy for a student to decide that, well, I'm, I'm here to get a, an electrical engineering degree, therefore I'll lock myself up in my room and study electrical engineering all the time and forget about everything else. I used to come home and cry for about two or three hours every night, and my husband would, my husband would calm me down, and I, I spent inordinate hours studying. I would, I would study till about four in the morning and get up about seven and study some more. And it was, it was the most frightening experience of my life because I'd been so used to easily breezing through a school and suddenly being confronted with this amazing amount of work and amazing amount of competition. And it, it was really, it was terrible. I have a calendar, which I keep up, which is you know, a couple months long. And every place that I have a quiz, I just kind of circle it in red. And, you know, the thing looks like it has smallpox. It, it's good, it goes wild. I mean, it's just <laughs> thousands of things. I have a quiz Monday and a quiz Friday and a problem sheet tomorrow and computer time tomorrow night and some problems due Monday and a small paper due Monday and something's due Wednesday and uh, something else, quiz Friday. These things mount up to where you feel you can't take the time. Uh, the school here is sort of a machine where you go in and they pound math and science into your head about six or seven hours a day. And when you get out of here, you can do any engineering problem. Uh, of course, uh, they don't seem to be very concerned with uh, how much emotion 
or creativity or individuality that, that you have left. Uh, they're not, there's no set pattern of destroying this. It just seems that in learning so much that is cold and unemotional so quickly, you don't have time to develop the emotional responses that are usually associated with, let's say, a more liberal education. The old magic of witchcraft tried to conquer the world by force. The new magic of science conquers by understanding. But with the amount of scientific knowledge doubling every 10 years, the price of understanding runs very high. What students feel for MIT is respect, not love. The mottos here uh, are such things as tech is hell. And it's sort of a pride and reverse to, to say how badly things are going and how rough the work is, because that just increases your pride when you do survive, as most of us do. And in the, in the yearbook, this is crunchy little guy. I, I see him in the libraries I, all the time. He's spent all his life in the libraries. And he's never shaved. We're not very shaved. And, and he's got a reset, recessive, you know, it is a recessive chin. Mm -hmm. He looks like a little mouse. And he sort of sits <laughs> there in tools. Okay. And, and he looks dirty, and he must smell. And he probably got good grades. Probably does. Yeah. And then who's going to be accepted to graduate school? Yeah. yeah. That's right. our, our friend upstairs on the sixth floor in electrical engineering, he has, he seems quite sociable and everything, but his grades oh. are a little bit lower, and Michigan wouldn't take him? Or was it oh, Gordon. Yeah. 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 Easier one. <laughs> because he was point, what, he was one-tenth of a point off. And they, they considered nothing else but his grade point average, and that no, was it. That's true. Tooling pays, it's it's especially when you when you have to do graduate work. But don't you need more of a balance anyway? Yeah. Yes, you need a balance, but but we are getting more of a training than an education here. That's the point. We are yes, learning science. True. We are not learning to live a well-rounded life because life does not concern us on a campus. If I'm shooting, uh, I'm going to shoot this at f two a. Not all MIT students can see that this professor may have something to teach that they would rarely find in a more amiable school. He's a millionaire, and the company he founded tests America's nuclear bombs. All through in a second and a half. MIT education, or, or the concept of the N MIT education, is, of course, the fact that, that you're getting a technical education. This, in our president's words, is a university polarized around science. And when you polarize something around science, it means you polarize it around complete rationality, and you don't leave too much room for concepts of humanity and concepts of of art and the more or less uh, unwell-defined things that, that make up human life. For most students, MIT's glittering opportunities more than make up for anything they might be missing in other directions. Which other school, they say, provides a large computer solely for the use of students? Each new temptation makes it harder to resist being drawn into MIT's atmosphere of constant overwork. I think you live about 20 years and four years here, and there's about 19 of the 20 years that just all homework, all studying. There's little of the t sherry sipping that you find at Harvard. Very few teas, it's more uh, the students will have a beer party or a rock and roll party on the weekend sort of to forget their studies rather than integrating the social with the academic at the institute. There's sort of two separate worlds here. People, people plan their time very carefully. They, they budget their time for their classes. They budget their time even for their dates. You know, it's, it's, it's as if that their, their whole social life were compartmentalized into this five or six hours on Saturday night because that's the time they have to spend on it.
This has been the news. Your reporter has been Dave Yu. This has been the WTBS News Mid-Evening Edition, compiled and edited by the wires of United Press International and the WTBS Local News Sources. Most MIT social gatherings are an escape from the pressures of school life. Even the student's radio station becomes little more than an elaborate toy, sort of giant hi-fi set. And good evening time now, 10 minutes past the hour of 9 o'clock. We're going to have two hours of Night Owl, or one hour and 50 minutes, depending upon how you look at it. And then we're going to have 10 minutes more news. I mean, for those of you who haven't heard the newscast, or it was slightly unintelligible, we are actually going to present in one hour and 50 minutes the whole newscast again. We recorded it, and we're going to play it back one more time. Right now, though, we're going to uh, play some records, telephone request type records. It's a telephone request program. That's why we're going to play telephone request records, right? What's that right? Yeah, well, it's Night Owl, part one. <laughs> and we have some telephone numbers if you'd like to call us up by dialing University 8 WTBS, Institute Extension 4969, or dorm line 0731. In fact, we might even, if you're really lucky, we might call up the Weather Bureau and find out what the temperature is outside. One of these light years! Pow! Right in the antenna! Well, I guess so. Anyway, it's by Theodore Bakel, the next song, that is. Uh, no, it isn't. It isn't by Theodore Bakel. Well, it's by somebody. Peter, Paul, and Mary, I think. Call the San Francisco Bay Blues. They do it right now, or at least they will be shortly. Some people have said they don't like my talking over the record, so I, I promise I won't do it. Showing at the RKO Keith Memorial Theater in Boston. The broadening effect of student activities is an essential part of the MIT education. And the school adds a final dimension by making the students completely responsible for organizing the way they live down to the last detail. There's no one here to help you, darling. Only to kill you. Oh, darling. Don't call me, darling. I hate you. Uh, see, Tallulah Bankhead, Stephanie Powers in Die, Die, My Darling. Columbia Pictures' intimate tale of terror in stabbing color. Oh, you love it. You'll adore it. About a third of MIT's undergraduates retreat each night from the MIT battleground to one of the 28 fraternity houses that they themselves own and operate. Fraternity life is a mixture of brotherly love, togetherness, and a liking for committees. Fraternity men run the student government and most of MIT's after-hours activities. Many students at MIT are interested in management and, uh, and executive work rather than purely laboratory science, things of that nature. In the student government, you learn how to work with other people. You learn how to to give orders, also how to take orders. You learn a lot of particular things, I think, that are also important. The finance board handles quite a bit of money. Uh, business managers of various organizations handle quite large sums in the thousands of dollars. Uh, how much longer are you going to pursue foundation support before you finally go to the institute and are requesting to have a the strategy on that will be to go 
to the Institute along with foundations. The Institute knows we exist. The President's office has a good idea that we may need money, because the foundations probably will not supply at all. But Mr. Tobin is a quite frank person, and he explained to me that these student, student activities have been traditionally looked down upon by, by various foundations. But he, he thinks we have a good chance. And we'll probably, the, the remainder of the term, and possibly a few appointments early in the summer. But the way the, the, the Institute seems to be viewing the conference, there's no question in my mind that we can get the money. MIT is no place for the squeamish. Its tensions are to be conquered, not washed away. The strain of knowing that what they learn today may be obsolete tomorrow affects everyone. MIT long ago gave up trying to produce engineers and scientists at the end of four years. For over two-thirds of its students, a bachelor's degree isn't the end of their education, it's the beginning. There's a tremendous emphasis on graduate school and getting into it. And I know that's what, especially my sophomore and junior years, that's, that's what really kept my nose to the grindstone. Because I figured, well, got to get the good grades, it's got to show. And I'd also heard a rumor that <laughs> the graduate school I was most interested in didn't take anybody that had more than one B in his major, which is close to being true. And I remember the day I got my first B in my major. And, you know, I was, <laughs> I went out and got drunk. You know, I was really, I really felt it. But uh, then the second one didn't bother me as much. <laughs> and the third one's coming this term, but that's okay. Graduate students are a very precious commodity in America. MIT has 3,500 of them. It's a simple concept. Every good scientist always has more ideas than time to work on them. So you give him a group of students who develop his ideas, and while doing so, turn into equally creative scientists. If the vitality of American science and technology has any single source, this is it. The basic change that takes place in the course of a graduate education is in your ability to cope with an unknown situation. The process whereby this is accomplished is that a graduate student is encouraged to begin research at an early time. In many ways, he jumps in over his head immediately and has to learn to swim. The amount of very specific knowledge is quite large that, that you are expected to, to absorb. And the, basic, the biggest question you ask is, how in the dickens am I ever going to get all this under my belt? The answer to the question is that you do it. You do it by exposure. Uh, more than any other single thing. The keystone of the whole educational process is to take all of this information that's being thrown at you and build it inside of you so you can use it to meet an unknown situation with a, with a certain amount of, well, intuition and reason, with reason being the dominant idea. Four years in MIT's undergraduate machine, plus another four years in graduate school, this is where MIT's quality comes from. The thing that makes it possible is America's immense wealth. In 1964, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and other similar organizations spent over 4,000 million pounds on research and development, much of it going to places like MIT. This systematic application of money to ideas is the energy inside the explosive growth of American technology since the war. MIT's President Julius Stratton tells of its effect on MIT. And MIT, uh, by the very 
nature of our uh, nature of the institution by the by virtue of the of our mission finds ourselves we find ourselves in the in the mainstream of this tremendous movement of the time and we have simply responded to it uh, we find the, the, what's going on here is is particularly relevant to the age I think we have been responsive to the needs of the time as we have seen them and this has brought great changes within as I say within the character of the institution and uh, the place has taken fire if you will it's uh, it's exciting it's interesting it's moving it's intense uh, it's a it's a remarkable uh, phenomenon MIT looks at the world and sees that the time that it takes for thought to become action is now so short that to think effectively a university has got to live in the real world and so MIT has turned into a corporation in the business of science and education competing hard for students professors and money it's a place where a sense of urgency is valued higher than a sense of history is much more interested in the living questions than in dead facts and if universities are usually places where you keep everything MIT's bias towards the world of today makes it a place that throws things away MIT runs on freedom wealth and overwork beyond that the only pattern is that there is no pattern Engineering at MIT depends on imagination, not handbooks. These students are studying the mysterious subtleties of how to connect people with machines. They want to know what happens to the operator when a machine on the moon takes two seconds to do what he tells it to do. If there's a force there, that means you're, you're hard against it. You want to be just at the point where there's no force. Try it there. Oops. For MIT's Dean of Engineering, Gordon Brown, the best engineers are artists. Uh, the composer-musician is clearly thought of as an artist. The composer-engineer, in my view, is an artist also. Because practicing the art of the organized forcing of technological train change is an art of great creativity. Let me give you an example. The people who designed the first jet aircraft, no, the people who conceived the first jet aircraft, practiced the art in a way whereby they pulled together abstractions very much the same way a creative musician pulls together abstractions. This experiment is trying to find out how people react in a car crash. It's typical of MIT that the students running the experiment are less interested in how to make cars than in how people use them. The MIT engineer is no longer a problem solver. He takes the discoveries of basic science and turns them into action. He's somebody who makes things happen, who wants to shape the world, not merely work for it.
For engineers, the biggest challenge is what do people need? Honey Ginsburg, Hello. we sure dig you. Will you make me sound so funny too? Howdy Beef Burger Driver. That's where you go. Just go to any Howdy Beef Burger Drive-In and get your Arnie's Army card. Yes, you want to become a card-carrying coward in the Arnie's Army. I'm a coward in Arnie's Army. 1510 WMEX. Where the good guys are. Good guy named Ginsburg for you, and the Wimax hit wave number four score going to Dickie Lee's Laurie. In the Wimax, winner's circle. The guest who? Free, 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 free. Shaking all over. Number three. Adventure Car Hop is the place to go for food. That's always right. In a world where science makes it possible to do anything, the outcome of satisfying every demand is complexity and confusion. Many MIT people are intimately involved in both the speeding up and taming of this runaway process. What makes it possible to be on both sides at once are computers. Computers are very nearly as important as books at MIT. Computers are no longer a novelty at MIT, even undergraduates use them regularly. But not many MIT people will admit to knowing what they are or what they might become. So let us... The changes that computers will bring can be seen very clearly in MIT's Project Mac. Most big computers are like a laundry. People leave their parcel of work and call back later to pick it up when it's finished. The Project Mac computer allows 150 people to talk to it at the same time. When one person stops to think, the computer instantly switches to another user. The keyboards can be anywhere. For Project Mac's director, Dr. Robert Fanner, computers are for everybody. Our every day's life uh, is very much dependent on the availability of a great variety of power tools, uh, from an electric drill to a vacuum cleaner, a power mower, or whatever may be the case. These power tools uh, helps us as individual in our daily physical labor by extending the power, the skill, and the precision of our muscles. We do not have as yet, however, uh, equivalent tools to help us in our daily intellectual labor, uh, whatever that might be, whether it's teaching or accounting or any other sort of intellectual activities that people carry out. The broad objective of Project Mac is to develop such tools. MIT people don't ask computers to make decisions. They ask questions, then look at the answers to see if they like them. Dr. Douglas Ross is one of two dozen MIT people who can ask their questions at home. But to be really useful, a computer must be more than a typewriter that answers back. It has to live a life of its own. Let's ask ourselves, what do we want out of another individual in order for us to be worthwhile to spend time talking with them? Well, we want the person to be reasonably smart, 
uh, we want a person to be well educated in a basic sense, but I think above all we want this person to be conscious of the world around him as he becomes by talking with a lot more people in addition to ourselves. Uh, we want him to, le to have learned through life. And therefore, we like his basic education to make him open-minded, flexible, so that this life experience can become valuable in intellectual work. One of the programs associated with Project MAC allows its operator to think in three dimensions. In more sophisticated versions, engineers can draw a bridge and see it bend under stress, and electronic circuits can be tested without building them. Models of complicated protein molecules are very tricky to build in metal, but easy to design and manipulate as three-dimensional computer drawings. By making computers cheap and easy to use, Project Mac is already well on the way to helping computers become as common as supermarkets or public libraries. MIT at times seems to be drowning in a sea of computers, but pure science is very big at MIT. So are industrial management, economics, and political science. All would slow down or stop without computer time. One of MIT's more unusual computer men is Ercolino Ferretti. First of all, I'd like to state that I'm a musician, and creative music is my primary concern. About 12 years ago, I began to think seriously as to where music was going and the propagation of the art of music. And I felt very strongly that I was unhappy with what the materials that were available for me to develop. So I decided that there must be a new way and a new method of generating sound, which would be the core for a new uh, process of creative music. Uh, after preliminary investigation, I found that I needed some technical background, and therefore I came to MIT and took subjects in physics and math and engineering and acoustics prepare myself for this new avenue of research in electronic music. And since then, I have developed a computer program which generates music and the system uh, of analysis which is coexistent with it. And this is the primary goal of the research and creating music. <laughs>
MIT got deep into electronics through an accident of history that made it the place where, during the Second World War, America spent $2,000 million on the development of radar. The work on radar at MIT's radiation laboratory showed, possibly for the first time, that when a large group of scientists can ignore the cost of their work, science becomes an almost irresistible force. The radiation laboratory was shut down immediately after the war. Only six years later, science and military needs met again at MIT. Following Russia's first atomic explosion in 1949, MIT's Lincoln Laboratory was set up to devise a warning system that would effectively protect America from surprise air attacks. The laboratory applied military money to MIT know-how and came up with the SAGE air defense system. A gigantic electronic orchestra consisting of dozens of huge computers and scores of radar sites. SAGE was later augmented by the almost equally vast Dewline system, a network of radars which stretch across the Arctic from Alaska to Greenland. But MIT's biggest and most spectacular contribution to the science landscape is only 25 miles away in Westford, Massachusetts. This plastic ray dome was the home of MIT's controversial needles in space experiment of a few years ago. MIT's Lincoln Laboratory also developed America's ballistic missile early warning system. One of its three major sites on Filingdale's Moor in Yorkshire has antennae that are directly descended from MIT's Millstone Hill radar. Today, this antenna spends much of its time tracking artificial satellites. Hey, Conrad, have a test. Quiet target. Who do you got? Two thousand miles. Millstone Hill radar can see a target only a yard square, two thousand miles away. This plastic golf ball on nearby Haystack Hill houses a radar that sees the same target 16,000 miles away. Haystack's antenna is a quarter of an acre in area. Its surface is a perfect parabola, accurate to a few hundredths of an inch. Few organizations anywhere have got either the imagination or the perfect coordination to even begin to design anything as complicated as this. The complete haystack system, including this lavish control center, cost $15 million. Lincoln Laboratory itself costs $50 million a year to run. All of it is military money. MIT manages the Lincoln Laboratory. The American Air Force owns it. 
MIT's Lincoln Laboratory is a good example of an American paradox which says that if you want to work on the most sophisticated engineering and scientific problems under entirely perfect conditions, then look for a job in a military laboratory. Eight years ago, MIT handed over the job of finishing the SAGE air defense system to a non-profit company which they called MITRE Corporation. Today, MITRE is only one of the dozens of companies that line Boston's Route 128 who find that military business can be big business. Since the war, Route 128 has been the focus of the explosive growth of the American electronics industry. It happened in Massachusetts because MIT was there. The missile boom of the 1950s meant immense prosperity for the dozens of Route 128 factories, as many of them became part of that curious subsidized capitalism which lets people make money out of military weapons that are obsolete the moment they're delivered. Faithful to the view that 90% of what matters to MIT happens outside it, MIT encourages business contacts. 110 companies pay between $20,000 and $100,000 each a year to be kept informed about MIT research. Through this and three dozen other programs, MIT stays firmly connected with Route 128 and the whole research and development bandwagon. MIT lives in a world where buying military security, whatever it costs, is the first priority. Its 200 military cadets serve as a reminder of the dilemma that a university like MIT faces. To stand aside may encourage disaster, yet involvement may bring a more subtle disaster where the university loses its freedom and independence. Already a third of America's scientists are estimated to be working on military projects. Can the scientists' influence on the military be more effective than the military's influence on the scientist? As military money continues to flow into American science and technology, some people think that its processes have crossed a mysterious threshold, beyond which invention and discovery feed on one another, and even now may be independent and self-sustaining. It's no coincidence that the sector of MIT that is growing quickest is that of political science. MIT's instrumentation laboratory is the second of its big defense operations. Ten percent of what it's costing to design and make the machinery to put a man on the moon is being spent here. The laboratory is a section of MIT's Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. There are no barriers between it and the academic world of MIT. Professor Charles Stark Traper is director of both laboratory and the department. In these later years, we have uh, had uh, uh, many experiences in dealing with ballistic missiles and uh, guidance for space. Uh, the Thor missile 
which actually was deployed in the UK, uh, carried guidance systems that came from the laboratory. The Titan II missile has uh, laboratory systems in them, and the Polaris missile. Uh, all, all of the Polaris missiles have guidance systems designed and put into production by the laboratory. We are now concerned with advanced developments of uh, higher performance uh, ballistic missile guidance systems, and we are primarily concerned with the development and putting into production of the guidance system for the manned flight to the moon, the Apollo mission. Because this kind of engineering can't be learned from books, each year, over a hundred MIT students work part-time in the instrumentation laboratory. For Professor Draper, this may be its most important work. Uh, we have provided education that couples academic experience into the practice of the real world. This way of approaching education has been very successful for the last uh, 25 years and I believe establishes a pattern which is new in the world, a pattern which uses uh, laboratory developing technology to couple academic achievements uh, with achievements in the real world. 325 degrees, 57 minutes and 40 seconds. Okay, now the schedule is the following. After Earth injection, we correct for the first time. This will be the first, the biggest correction maneuver of all. Now I need some color, but I don't have it. So, and what we here have is spin up after the maneuver. How many days? days? Four days after. About four to six, nobody knows. And uh, 20 days before Mars. We spin down again. Venus. Venus. Oh, ah, 20 days before Venus, sure. Before flyby, we spin down, have a mid course, the so called mid course correction that can be rather late. We correct the mid course correction immediately before Venus, about four days without spinning up again, have the unpowered flyby, correct the unpowered, unpowered flyby. <laughs> Uh, four days after Venus, <coughs> and stay then, spin, spun up, I don't know what the right word is. 20 days before Mars, we spin down again, and have the mid-course correction due to that lag here. We spin down, there's about 20 days before, and have a final correction about four days before. Is there any correction and on that first four-day segment? Hmm? I'm just leaving Earth. Do you have a correction just before you go? Here, here in no, between. No, on the first one. On your first four days, you fire. No, you no, my goodness. <laughs> that ascent. You have, you have a long ascent. You have no correction after your initial firing. That, until you get to that, that one. one. This one. You wait, you wait some you time. Four days. You know, that's, this, is the, this is correction of, of initial conditions. And then, then you spin up after that. Hmm? And then you spin up after that. Then you spin up after this, and then you wait until here. And for the whole Venus flyby, you stay unspinning. That means <coughs> the spin up and spin down maneuvers reduced to three. Three times up, three times down. Oh.